<clears throat> can I uh, can I try and do the screen share thing? Yeah, let me stop mine, and I think you have. Then I should be able to. I think you have permission to share. Ah, okay. Somewhere. I see. I see. Okay. So, try that. All right. Can you, you guys see in some YouTube? Oh yeah. Yeah, I pulled this one up. Right. All right. Although you said that you can't hear it. Yeah, there is a button somewhere to share sound. I forget where it is though. But ah. Works for you. Uh, I don't remember where that is. Let me see. Got it. that made this harm. Are we still waiting on anyone yet? We are being censored. America's news outlets censored. no longer provide the truth. I'm Joshua Phillip, senior investigative reporter. Okay, so I think Noah's preaching it at us today, so give him the floor. <laughs> All right. So we're going to be looking at section 8.3 in the book. Um, if you have it with you or near you, I would recommend grabbing it quick. Um, I have a bunch of tables and images and stuff in there, but um, I would recommend, I don't have them all, so it might just be helpful for reference and when we try and do some example problems. Hey, John. Hey. Yeah, what's up? Did I, was I unmuted? You're good. Okay. You driving? Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, zoom on the phone is tricky. Sorry. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. I'm just saying good morning. Well, good morning to you. All right. Uh, let's get the screen share going. I don't want that one. We're on our knees. We're on our knees. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the 
All right, can everyone see my screen now? Yep, Professor Shrine. Okay, perfect. Yep, I'm trying it out. So yeah, this section is pretty much on atmospheric transport um, and dispersion once there's a hazardous release into the atmosphere. I have another verse of the day in case you guys didn't see the first one. Awesome. So we got Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So I think this verse, or these two verses in particular, it's kind of like a chain reaction here. So it's saying, um, so instead of worry, just turn all your worries over in prayer to God. And then um, in turn, what you'll get from that is God's peace, um, which is, you know, more than we can actually understand. And then also this peace will then guard our hearts and minds. So it's really just like a positive chain reaction that comes from this stuff. So. Just especially in a weird kind of uncertain time, it's just a good reminder to lift everything up in prayer that you're experiencing or any hardships or anything like that. So it's our verse of the day. And then a quick overview of what we're going to be kind of covering in this section, um, why this is important, um, the atmospheric environment and just some of the factors that go into uh yeah the development of the equations and then the development and use of the models uh we're going to be looking at the like paquill and gifford or pasquill and gifford model um so why is it important um so the book describes two main types of releases uh the puff and the plume uh, the puff is like an instantaneous single release, and then the plume is more of a steady, constant release. Um, so basically, that should remain constant in time up to a certain point. So um, at a certain point downwind, it should always be at that position, the same concentration throughout time uh, because it's a steady release, where the puff will change because it's just one release. Uh, uh, yeah, at one point in time. Um, so the book gave a case study of Bohapal, India. I don't exa exactly know how you say that, but um, it was one of the worst chemical plant disasters. Uh, it released an acutely toxic chemical, uh, methyl isocyanate, and it traveled off the plant property into the nearby city of Bohapal, and the result was over 2,500 deaths. Um, and that's literally just through air dispersion. So like it definitely matters. It's very important to keep track of and um, and know these types of, of things and being able to model and predict concentrations downwind is very important. Um, so that would be an example of a puff. And then the last point there, the uh, RECRA facilities or hazardous waste sites can pose more long-term health threats, and that would be more of the example of the plume or the idea of the plume, which is just a continuous release. If you have uh, like an open vat or drum of something um, that's just constantly exposed and uh, volatilization is constantly happening from that, you should have basically a steady stream of plume downwind. Uh, so going into the atmospheric environment, um, most of the potential health effects um, that can be hazardous to uh, any living thing really occur in the troposphere, which is the lowest lowest layer of the atmosphere. Um, and this extends from around 4.7 miles to 10.6 miles. And that kind of depends on, uh, I think, your elevation and a couple other factors. And then some of the most common, uh, well-known factors that uh, affect the mass transport of pollutants would be things such as the temperature, uh, the wind, which would essentially just be pressures, pressure differences in the atmosphere, and then cloud cover. Uh, and also a lot of times when um, we're looking at these and we'll get into kind of the, the coefficients involved for, for helping to predict and model 
the dispersion. Um, but a key factor in doing that is the atmospheric stability. Um, and this is, yeah, again, helpful for evaluating these fluxes. So the maximum atmospheric stability um, is found when the actual temperature profile is equal to the adiabatic lapse rate, which is just the temperature profile um, based on the compressibility of dry air. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, I guess. And also the maximum um, atmospheric stability basically would, would give you the, um, well, yeah, the last point there, deviation from the uh, adiabatic lapse rate from the actual temperature profile results in a well-mixed troposphere, which so that is like higher dispersion. Um, so the farther you get away from that, um, the more mixing you're gonna have, the more, or the, the higher wind and uh, farther distance likely your pollutant will travel. And this is some more information here continued. Um, the, the cycle, basically just the day and the cycle of, you know, the days and nights and the solar radiation that goes on during the day, um, it has kind of a, just a warm air rising effect. And then at night, uh, the air, you know, tends to sink once it cools in temperature in certain regions, like you could kind of think of, um, the far west and like in more desert like conditions, there tends to be a bit more, uh, significant. Uh, fluctuation there and that can have a really significant effect on pollutants that are also in the air rising and falling um, also in things like valleys and, and mountains that can kind of create dead zones um, and then uh, stability classes which you see below there in table 8.1 um, these are used to estimate these dispersive fluxes um, the rates of dispersion and transport are affected again by wind velocity, the turbulence, and plume and, and puff properties. Um, these are some slightly additional ones here. And then um, the way that the chart has it broken up is pretty easy to follow there. But um, something that the book did point out was if you notice, so, so A is going to be your least stable. Um, so you're going to notice that's going to be on a, during the day with a strong to medium intensity radiation and a pretty low wind. So actually when there's more, slightly more wind during the day, um, that actually makes the, um, yeah, the, the stability greater. And then at night, it's the opposite effect. So um, when it's cloudy or when it's, um, when there's a, a lower wind speed, you're gonna have uh, just more stability, more atmospheric stability, and then um, if there's greater wind speed at night, it's going to be yeah, the opposite. So, so F is the most stable you can get, and A is the least stable in this case. Um, so the book kind of laid out just a simple step-by-step, -step, um, which is really only two steps, and that's just to determine the atmospheric transport. Um, so the first thing you have to do is estimate or quantify in some way the flux of the hazardous waste from the source. So you have to kind of yeah, use those volatilization equations. Um, so that would be back from uh, 6.8. Um, it's just the one for open containers, which would could be used for vats or drums, as we kind of talked about. That could be in like a rec ref facility, and that would be more of like the plume. Um, and then also equations 6.25 and through 26 um, could be for contaminated soils. So once you know that volatilization rate, you can basically uh, find the amount of mass that has been released into the air at a certain point. Um, the book also mentioned that these equations aren't necessarily the most accurate all the time. So if possible, monitoring data is more reliable um, than these volatilization um, equations. So um, if possible, that's better to use. Um, and then the step two is just proceed to using these estimated concentrations. Um, and you can, or you can, you can find the estimated concentration um, using the dispersion models that we're going to talk about here 
if you are aware of these volatilization rates or just the mass that's released into the air. So the Pasquale Gifford model is the one that's um, talked about commonly and mentioned in the book. Um, the atmospheric stability, basically the first point there is just outlining how they came up with it. Um, it's correlating uh, atmospheric stability, fundamental mass transfer relationships, and then uh, fixed law and an advection dispersion equation. Uh, both of those are mentioned previously in chapter eight. And then these are combined with the uh, um, meteorological conditions by developing the dispersion coefficients. So those were kind of all linked together and they used all of these to come up with these coefficients. And um, if you have your books on you, um, there's a few different tables on the bottom of page 416. Um, the first one you'll see is figure 8.8. .8, and then that'll go through um, figure 8.11. And those are going to be, yeah, you're going to use those to find your, your sigma values. And those sigma values are your coefficients um, for dispersion. Um, and then you'll see that um, if, you're ch if you're taking a look, I think I actually have them coming up after this, so we'll take a look at them specifically. Um, these dispersion coefficients, though, that are, you'll see here are estimated by using the stability class and the average wind speed. Um, and most of the time, that is the wind speed is taken as a measurement um, just using uh, meteorological devices. Um, there's also ways you can estimate it, but more commonly, it's just a, a sample measurement in a localized area. Um, and then the last part there, like I mentioned before, these are going to be divided into two um, modeling types with equation sets for each one. Um, <clears throat> you're going to have um, the plume category is going to have uh, two sets of equations. One is going to be a general release from ground level. And the other one is going to be from a certain height. And a lot of times that's, that could be the equivalent to a uh, smokestack or something, an air stripper, something that's going to have some height to it, where um, more typically a puff is going to be an accident or uh, like a tanker spill of some sort. And so that's going to likely occur at the ground level, not at you know a height of like 30 feet or something like that. Yeah, so these are the ones I was talking about. These are just the these are just the graphs that are showing you um, based on the the atmospheric stability classes that I had mentioned. Um, so again, you're going to have a higher coefficient generally for the least stable class A, and then a lower one for F. Um, and then these are actually measured by yeah, downspeed or distance downwind, and then your sigma was actually a combination of, forget what the units were on that. Uh, the sigma values are a function of wind velocity and atmospheric stability. It's given in meters there. Um, so this is uh, gonna be kind of the equation set that we're gonna use for the puff modeling. Um, most of the puffs are, like I said, the result of tanker accidents um, or just spills occurring at the ground level. So there's no height term built into these equations. Um, and then this is also assuming that uh, the wind is moving in the x direction. And you'll see that in the last half of the equation where uh, your x term and your sigma x is built into the, the u term there. Uh, for wind. So yeah, basically the it's pretty much as is there and the you'll see the variables there representing each thing. Use your typically your wind speed. Um, you're looking for the mass of the contaminant release, not a concentration. Uh, so if you're not given a con or if you're not given a mass directly, you have to figure that out somehow. And then um, these typically have in the book, they lay out three different equations for the puff, and that's basically just 
incorporating uh, the different coordinates in each time. So the first one's there. First one there is your most basic, um, and that's going to just be for your an x direction downwind at a certain time. So these concentrations, the contaminant concentrations given here, are a function of position and time. Um, where, as you'll see, as we get into the plume, it's going to be just the uh, just time because it, or sorry, just position because it's assumed that at any given time after this plume has started, it's going to be the same uh, concentration. So time isn't really as much of a factor in the plume modeling. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is this is the first plume modeling set of equations. This one is used at um, when there's a release at ground level. So pretty much the same thing. These are on page 420. So that's going to be 8.18 through 8.20. And again, yeah, those are just going to be basically the same equation, but just with terms added on for each um, x, y, z value. Um, so if you're on a different coordinate system, I think is when those come into play. Um, but it looked like most commonly you're going to be using the simplest version of those, um, which is essentially assuming that uh, like the y and z values are equivalent at zero, so they just kind of fall out. Uh, and then finally, we have the plume equations. Um, this is going to be with a release at a given height above the ground surface. And this is again with the wind moving in the x direction. Um, so a slight variation. Um, you basically just have the term added on for uh, the release at a given height. <clears throat> and then same thing, uh, equations 8.21 and through 8.23, basically all the same thing, just with additional terms added on uh, for the different coordinate values. All right, so this was the example from the book. Um, so if you have your book, you'll see it there, but I don't want you to look at it yet. Don't look at the solution. Um, so this is from 8.2. Um, this is a hazardous waste spill um, that has occurred, releases 10 kilograms of TCE into the air. If the spill was at night under mostly overcast skies and the wind has a velocity of seven meters per second in the X direction, estimate the TCE concentration a half a kilometer down gradient. So if you have some scrap paper, I would encourage you to try and fill this out or get started on it, at least on your own. Um, yeah, you're going to want to refer back to figures uh, 8.8 .8 and 8.9 to figure out. In this case, um, we're given that sigma y and sigma x are equal to each other. So if you can pull that number off, that's going to be both of those. Um, and then, yeah, for sigma z, you're going to use figure 8.9. Um, and then they use the equation, the simplest form of the puff equation in this in instance, which was um, 8.15. So I'm just going to give us a minute and then we'll jump back in here and we're going to just run through the solution.
All right. Hopefully you got a chance to work that through a little bit. If not, we're going to go over it right now. So the first step um, in the solution here is just to estimate the sigma values. Um, so you need all three for this equation. Um, so like I said, those can be estimated um, yeah, with figure 8.8 .8 and 8.9. And then you also are going to need to find the stability class. Um, so given that the wind velocity is over the, the six meters per second, that basically makes it a stability class D, unless the only other case is if, um, yeah, there was a strong radiation intensity during the day. And that would be a C, so that's pretty close. Um, so you have to find that first and then use that to um, figure out your, your sigma values. The next step is basically just going to be to uh, plug in all your, your conditions, your variables there. Um, so in this case, you're going to have your, um, your distance, it's 500 meters, half a kilometer. Um, your wind velocity, U, and I think everything else we have. Um, oh, you have to estimate. Yeah, yeah. So to estimate your your mass, or you have your mass given already. So um, if it were a concentration, uh, you just need to basically multiply it by the distance. I think that's going to be our next example, but we'll take a look at that case. Um, so. Plugging this all in at your time value, um, which, yeah, I guess, you, yeah, we had to solve for time here. So um, it's going to be a little over a minute. And then based on both of these two factors, you end up getting 36 milligrams um, per meter cubed. So that's pretty straightforward. There's nothing really to trip you up there. You just need to solve for your unknown variables. Um, and we're going to do one more. This is going to be the, the example 8.3. And this one's pretty much the same deal, um, but just a slight variation. Uh, so we'll take a look at that one. So in this problem, there's a mean flux of paratheon from a 20 meter square pesticide formulation area. Um, so the mean flux is uh, 4.3 milligrams per meter squared per day, per meter squared day. So if daytime conditions were moderate, with moderate solar radiation, control the atmospheric stability, and the mean wind velocity is four meters per second, estimate the paratheon concentration at a farmhouse two kilometers downwind. Um, so this is basically gonna be the same setup However, um, this is going to be a plume variation, not a puff. So you have to go find your equation for uh, the plume model. And since this is assumed to be from ground level, you're going to start off using uh, equation 8.18. Um, and you're also not given the mass directly. So you just have to solve for the mass of your, um, your chemical and then find your sigma values and you are given your wind speed. So that's all you need to do. We'll take another minute and we'll just go over um, that in a, in a second here. Noah, did you catch if the book explains how the letters A through F relate to what's stable? Because the, the table gives us A through F, and then the first couple ones for the for the for now for the plume ones they give us for the sigma values A through F. For the puff ones, they just say unstable, neutral, and stable. But yeah. 
I, that one that one i was like a little con- like confused about yeah. I was like, what's the difference here um and i i didn't find anything um yeah like why yeah. the difference is that yeah after reading through everything um i th- i think that uh I mean, it does go from A is unstable to F is stable. Right. So a D would be neutral. So I think the for the ones with three of them, maybe A and B are unstable, C and D are neutral, and E and F are stable. Now for the other ones, you can just tell directly from the letter. But I think that's how it works. Yeah, I do wonder why they would switch it up. Yeah. Would I have to ever do with the fact that, like, when you're modeling a a plume you'd want a little more precision um would that ever be the case versus like a pop i don't know if there would be like a strong difference there yeah that could be that could be i've seen like the i guess the ones in an environmental engineering book are for what we call the plume and they do have a through f but yeah maybe the the off is less certain and you can just kind of divide it into three yeah in cases <clears throat> all right so we'll go over that example real quick so the first step is to find your mass um, of the paratheon so you basically are just going to take your um, your mean flux and multiply it by the area, um, and that's going to allow you to get your units in uh, milligrams per second. And the next step is going to be to estimate your sigma y and sigma z values. Um, so we're, we know our distance here, 2,000 meters. And um, from that, we're able to find a stability class. <clears throat> and yeah, this is just an assumption. Um, in the book, they say they tend to make the conservative assumption. Um, and then we're able to use our figures uh, 8.10 and 8.11 to come up with our sigma values. Um, and then once we have those, we're able to determine our concentration um, just by plugging in uh, yeah, our variables there. And then we get uh, 1.57 times 10 to the negative ninth milligrams per meters cubed. Is there any questions on these or anything that we've gone over or questions you have for Dr. Sorens that you might want to elaborate on? When might we use the models uh, like C? concentration x y z direction or x y direction versus just in the x direction yeah so i was trying to i was trying to figure that out honestly and i i don't know for certain although i i would assume that it would be a case where you might have information along axes but it's not in line with the plume so like i don't know if you would know wind speed going east or west but that's not the direction your plume's going. I think this would allow you to use that information still um, to, to figure out the, the concentration of the plume and the direction it is going, but I'm not exactly sure, but it's basically just um, 
yeah, just allowing you to use a coordinate system that's like more more in depth where things tend to drop out of these equations if your wind and your contaminant is going in the direction of like one axis uh, in the simplest form of these equations. They assume it's going in the x direction. And so that basically means that, um, and if it's at ground level, uh, your y and z term are gonna be zero then. So I think sometimes, I think it just depends um, yeah, on the information you have and what direction that information, like what vector that is exactly. But I don't, I don't know, Dr. Swens, if you want to elaborate on that, I'm not exactly sure. That's kind of what I assumed just based on looking at this, but. So the, I actually have, let's see if I can, let's see if this works. So a plume, and I actually have the, I could share it, I have the environmental engineering one. Looks kind of like that. And if I draw contours, it's gonna get higher in the middle there. And what this equation here, this has the, it doesn't have the, y and z in there because y is zero along the center line and z is zero at the at the ground level so this equation here is really a slice so if the wind speed is going that way it's just a slice right down the middle there so it gives you that but you might also want to know what it is side to side and up and down. And so we might want to know, you know, if there's a house here, we might want to know what the concentration will be there. And so we can use the, the Y term in there, figure out what is off the side. By the way, if I take a slice down here, which is actually what we did in the environmental engineering one, it also will look kind of the same way, bigger toward the middle. So yeah, there are cases where you want to know, not just in the direct line, but what it is side to side. And I wonder, Noah started this out with the, the Bhopal in India, accident and I I remember that vividly and I looked it up it was 1984 I didn't realize it was that long ago but the uh, I bet someone has since gone and tracked done some modeling of it and see and again that was I guess would be in this one a puff but being trying to figure out exactly what direction the wind went and then if people got sick or died off to the sides of that not just directly in the direction of it to see how far it spread side to side but yeah that was so calling it that was like four thousand people killed by that puff from the chemical factory but anyway was that what you were Asking about John? Yep, that sounds good. Yeah. You might want to know the, the, this side to side in addition to what happens down the center. I also have a quick question. Um, I may just be incompetent in reading graphs, but um, figure 811 for the signal. I was getting like somewhere around 100. Am I just like not reading this thing right? This example? We're using stability class. So it's on page 418. Um, uh, what did they get? They, they got, got 220. 220. So it's not like I'm just a little bit off. So yeah, I don't see that either, to be honest with you. Yeah, because it's for A. No, even for A it would be. Let's see again. Okay, so from 
the ability class C from figure 811 sigma Z is. Two yeah, I don't, I think they were look. I bet they looked at, uh, wait, what, how many kilometers? Two kilometers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if they looked at 20 kilometers. Yeah, that doesn't seem to line up. That would be, yeah. Looks like it's just a little over a hundred to me. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I wasn't yeah, there. yeah, that's a good catch. <laughs> what about signal Y? That looks about right for, well, I don't know. It's closer. That's about right for, yeah, for sigma y, it looks about right. One twenty. The environmental book had some equations for those sigma values so plugged in. Not just pick them off a graph. Yeah, I thought I remembered that, but I didn't see anything like that in here. Yeah. Aside from that, I just had um, these homework problems to look at, and they're pretty similar to the example problems. Uh, yeah, in the chapter eight problems here, there wasn't a ton of, the first few are, um, yeah, like atmospheric based. The other ones have to do a lot with aquifers fills and, right. and stuff that we've uh, looked at kind of already, so. So 8.4 and 8.5 are, are good to look at. Um, yeah, so I don't know, Dr. Storm, did you have the intention that there would be a, a separate homework based on this section? Yeah, I was thinking okay. that. We'll do a okay. couple of problems and then maybe I'll pick one out too. Okay. So one is okay. And then A five is instantaneous release. Okay. That or we could add in to I didn't see like eight point seven. And some of those other ones might be, they incorporate a height in there too. Not that it makes a huge difference, but. Okay. Yeah, I might look at some of those, I might add yeah. some. But. Yeah. Okay. Yep, so that's, that's all I got. All right. Any other questions? The, uh, so we've taken a little excursion. I'm going to switch Noah's out here into uh, yep. here's our syllabus. 
we've taken a little side excursion to uh, to chapter eight contaminant release. We've now spent like two weeks in that and we've done some air pollution there, air pollution transport. So really it was, what we did today is really this section here on the syllabus from a few weeks from now. So our next thing, I was thinking toxicology and I was gonna kind of skip that or maybe do a short part on that, but actually there's more stuff there. Like I've said before, when I have you all talk, you, uh, I'm kind of locked in my mind on, on what I think is important, but you, you all notice different things. So I'm considering doing that. We still have two of you who uh, have not preached yet. I think the two BBs haven't preached, right? Yeah, that's right. I don't know if, so if, uh, so we actually have, if we look at it this way, if we go by the text, five more chapters. I don't know how much time we'll spend in there. Some of the remediation characterization we've uh, kind of relates to what we've done already with the, where's the benzene and stuff like that. But I don't know what, what are you thinking, Brandon, since you're the, you're kind of, you have an interest in, I don't know, I thought toxicology might be in, in your interest area a little bit. Well, you guys think about it and we'll see if we want. So on for Friday, I would say on Friday, but maybe for Friday, maybe I'll record something. I'll do a little kind of follow up on the air pollution transport, what Noah just went through, and then I'll put together a homework. And then maybe next week we can uh, do something with toxicology. I'm kind of open to different order of hitting these things. So if Ben and Brandon want to think about which of these or which parts of these they might want to take on, I'm open to that. So any final questions for today? We're leaving the future a little open-ended there. But the next thing is is on the to finish up on the, the air pollutant transport. Okay. Well, hearing no objection, do I have a motion uh, to end the meeting? I approve. Okay. All right. We'll move on and I'll see you guys later. Have a great day. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. All right. Is there yeah. a water resources class today? Uh, no, I will. I will poke my head in if anyone has any questions. But the uh, the class is pre-recorded. So. Okay, sounds good. Have a good one, Dr. Sorens. All right, you too.